Hi. Today I want to talk about compositions. How do we present compositions of these complicated minerals? And here's just an example of how complicated it can be. This is a single mineral, garnet, but depending on what elements we substitute into which sites, we can have different end member compositions. Magnesium, iron, manganese end members of the aluminum silicate garnets. Or we can look at the calcium garnets, substitutions into the octahedral site, chromium, aluminum, and iron. And it's, it's beautiful. It gives rise to all different color garnets. That's one of the things I love about garnets. So the first thing I want to do is develop a graphing scheme for compositions. Then I want to go to talk about binary composition diagrams and then ternary composition diagrams. So first, let's develop binary composition diagrams. And I want to explain how you would plot and interpret compositions on a binary diagram, and then ultimately we'll plot and interpret compositions on a ternary diagram. So the first question is, how would you plot the composition of a magnesium silicate? OK, the first thing I would think of is you might choose magnesium on one axis and or magnesium oxide on one axis, and silicon dioxide, SiO2, as another axis. And we can do that. Here, for example, is the number of moles of magnesium oxide. Here is the number of moles of SiO2. And if we know the number of moles, then we can simply plot a composition. This would have SiO2, one mole of that, and one mole of MgO. So this would be MgSiO3. This has two moles of magnesium oxide, so Mg2SiO4. Now, this approach retains the information on the number of moles of magnesium oxide and silicon dioxide that are in the particular material we're talking about. That's not often what we care about. Usually what we care about are the relative abundances of the oxide components not the absolute amounts. So here, for example, is a question, which composition here represents enstatite? And the answer is all of them. They are all of them can be used to represent enstatite. MgSiO3, that's the simplest way of expressing the composition. Mg2Si206 is site-specific. It turns out there are two octahedral sites. And this is the unit cell composition for proto-enstatite, which is a particular structure of enstatite. And this is the unit cell for ortho-enstatite, which is a, a different structure for enstatite. All of these, they're, technically, they, they convey different information but they all have the same relative abundances, proportions of magnesium and silicon. And usually, it's those relative proportions that we care about. In fact, if we think about what that means, it means that the composition of a mineral is actually a vector that emanates from the origin in a particular direction. So this vector emanating from the origin represents enstatite, equal proportions of MgO and SiO2. This vector represents forsterite, twice as much magnesium as silicon. This one represents quartz. This one represents periclase, which is pure MgO. So what do we do? We end up defining a binary composition diagram in terms of the intersection point of the vector with a 45 degree line that goes from one mole on our x-axis to one mole on our y-axis. OK, that seems really kind of esoteric, but it's really pretty straightforward. What this does is it sets up a plotting position where the x direction is this component, the number of moles of SiO2 divided by the number of moles of SiO2 plus MgO. And the y position is the number of moles of MgO divided by the number of moles of SiO2 plus the number of moles of MgO. So enstatite equal proportions, 1 half, 1 half. 1 divided by 2, 1 divided by 2. This allows us to take a two-dimensional diagram and collapse it to a one-dimensional diagram with 
pure SiO2 on one end, pure MgO on the other end. And so here is that diagram. Here's periclase, pure MgO. Here's quartz, pure SiO2. Here's enstatite, half SiO2, half MgO. And here's forsterite, has twice as many moles of MgO as SiO2. So here's a question for you. Phthalite, so here's pure iron on this side. Here's pure SiO2 on this side. Where would phthalite plot on this diagram? And the answer is one third of the way from FeO to SiO2. So you can think of this if we're plotting the proportion of SiO2 from 0 to 1. The number of moles of SiO2 is 1. The number of moles of SiO2 plus the number of moles of FeO is 3. 1 divided by 3 is 1 third. That's where B plots right here. This is a super important point. If you're plotting compositions, and you have one component that is more abundant than another component. So here FeO is more abundant than SiO2. There's two moles of FeO, one mole of SiO2. The plotting composition has to be closer to the component that is more abundant. Please always remember that. It will save you a world of hurt. I use that all the time to figure out if I'm plotting compositions correctly. Now, it can be a little tricky if we're mixing molecules that have multiple cations. So here is an example where we're talking about moles of Al2O3 and moles of MgO. So here we have periclase on this side, corundum on this side, that's all fine. But when we look at spinel, spinel is a mixture of one mole of Al2O3 and one mole of MgO, so it plots halfway in between. Okay, that's different from phthalite, where we were mixing two moles of FeO and one mole of SiO2. We're not mixing two moles of AlO3 halves, we're mis mixing one mole of Al2O3. So when you go through and do your proportions, you just have to be very careful about how many moles of the cation actually go into the oxide component that we're mixing. Okay, so that's binary composition diagrams. Ternary composition diagram, so where do we go from there? Well, if you think about it, if we have two components on an x-axis, it seems like, well, we can just add a vertical axis, right? We can have another component. Let's make it FeO here. The problem with that is that this is 100% MgO, and as we go up in this direction, we're getting more and more FeO. But the same thing has to be true over here. As we go up in this direction, we're getting more and more FeO until we have 100% FeO and 100% FeO on these two different axes. So that's kind of a problem. So what we do is we simply say, well, this point and this point are actually the same, and we bring them together to a single point. This becomes our pure FeO composition, and we end up with a triangle. FeO on one corner, MgO on another corner, SiO2 on another corner. I've rotated this around, but here's the, here's the basic idea, SiO2, MgO, FeO, and here's where these different materials plot. Periclase, MgO, Vustite, FeO, a mixture of 50% FeO and 50% SiO2 is ferrocellite, FeSiO3, 50-50 make enstatite, two-thirds MgO, one-third SiO2 makes forsterite, two-thirds FeO, one-third SiO2 makes phaolite, and any composition in here would make the mineral olivine. Okay, so this is what ternary graph paper looks like. So the corners here represent 100% of each component. So this corner is 100% of A, this corner is 100% of B, and this corner is 100% of C. Anything that contains all a, B, and C components in some significant proportion is going to plot somewhere in the middle of that. We'll, we'll get there in just in a minute. 
The sides represent different proportions of whatever two end members they fall between. So this side line is a mixture between 100% A and 100% C, so halfway in between would be 50% C and 50% A. And similarly, this side line is a binary mixture between A and B. So this point here would be, it's closer to A, so it's 70% of A, farther from B, so it's 30% B. And then similarly, the bottom one is mixtures be between components B and C. So here, closer to C, this would be 80% C and 20% B. Now, the farther you move away from a corner, the less you have. So here is 100% C. If I move farther away, if I go in this direction, it's 80% C. If I go in this direction, it's also 80% C. And so any line that is in this orientation, which is parallel to this sideline, in fact, this is a constant amount of C. So this is 100% C, 90% C, 80% C, 60%, 40%. 20%. The, and similarly for A, this would be 90, 80, 70% A, and similarly for B, 100, 90, 80, 70, 60, and so on. Now the intersection of the lines of constant A, constant B, and constant C gives you the plotting position. So here, the mole fraction of A is given by the number of moles of A divided by number of moles of A, number of moles of B, number of moles of C. Similarly, for mole fraction of B, or the percent of B, and the mole fraction of C, or the percent of C. And that's the first thing you need to figure out. So if I have 30% A, that defines this line, 0, 10, 20, 30. If I have 20% C, I have 0, 10, 20%. And it is the intersection of these lines that defines the plotting position. Now, you can see it only takes two compositions to figure out the plotting position. Always do all three. Always plot up all three. If they intersect at a point, then you know you got your plotting position correct. If they plot up in a triangle, it means that one or more of your plotting positions is incorrect, and so this serves as a double check for where, you're actually, where the composition actually plots. And again, you got to be really careful with components that are multiples of the cation. So the, uh, here, Spinel plots at 50% Al2O3 plus MgO even though it has two aluminums in it. So here's a question. If feldspar has a composition 70% albite, albite corners down here, 20% anorthite, anorthite cor corners up here, 10% orthoclase, orthoclase is over here, and these are the names of the different regions for each of the feldspar compositions, what composition would you call that feldspar according to this diagram? The answer is oligoclase. This is the plotting position. And one of the first things I look at is which component is in the greatest abundance. That component is albite, so I have to be close to the albite corner, 90, 80, 70. There are only two possibilities here. It's either oligoclase or anorthoclase. And with only 10% orthoclase, I'm sitting here in the oligoclase field. And of course, I could also check to make sure that I'm at 0, 10, 20% anorthite to be sure that I'm in the right plotting position. So here's one. Now this is by weight. Suppose you're given 100 grams of a mineral that is 75 grams of anorthite, 5 grams of orthoclase, and 20 grams of albite. Which shape would represent the mineral? And the answer here is the heart. Again, I look at what component is the most abundant, anorthite. OK, so 100, 90, 80, 70, 75. Because this is mostly anorthite, I have to be in the upper half of this triangle. So even if you knew nothing else but that it had more anorthite than anything else, 
you could guess that this is likely the correct plotting position. Of course, you'd want to make sure 5% orthoclase, 20% albite to ensure it is the correct plotting position. But given these four choices, this is the one that makes the logical sense. There are lots of other examples of ternary plots. It is not just mineral compositions. Sandstone classification is a ternary diagram with quartz and chert at the upper corner, feldspar down here. These are arcoses along here. Rock fragments are down in this corner. And so depending on what your composition is, the percentage of quartz and chert, 50%, the percent of rock fragments, if it's 10% or less, then it's an arcose. Uh, if it's not very much feldspar, if, if it's, say, 5 or 10% feldspar, but 50% quartz and chert, then it's a litharonite, and so on. Plutonic rocks, this is quartz, alkali feldspar, plagioclase over here, and the proportions of these three minerals, quartz, alkali feldspar, K feldspar, and plagioclase define the name that we assign to these plutonic rocks. So if it's got 50% quartz, and of the feldspar compositions, of the different feldspars, the majority, 75%, is plagioclase, then it would plot in this field. If it's mostly K-feldspar, then it would plot in this field, and we'd give it a different name. Soils classifications, also a ternary diagram with clay at the top, sand in the lower left corner, silt over here. If it's a mixture of kind of approximately equal abundances, then we call it a clay loam. And if it's mostly sand and clay, it's called a sandy clay. If it's mostly silt, it's called silt, and so on. Coastal systems is the system dominated by rivers or waves or tides, and there's this whole classification. Human environment interactive systems are also ternary diagrams, where this is mostly social interactions, biotic interactions, and abiotic interactions. So there are many, many, many different ternary diagrams that we use in the geosciences and environmental sciences to, just to, to classify things. So at this point, I hope you'd be able to plot and interpret compositions, not just on a binary composition diagram, but also on a ternary composition diagram. All right, thanks.